Well, this is really a delight. I mean, these, these gatherings are always very gratifying for me, and uh, always very stimulating. Preparing, I try to prepare uh, a little something different each time, incorporate new things that are happening either, and that are coming to the fore. But uh, this is a, an exceptionally gratifying occasion, uh, as you'll see. Uh, I wouldn't be up here were, were it not uh, for John. I'm, I'm quite confident of that. So there was a little confusion on the, the title of my presentation. Uh, I don't think uh, John has been that elusive or difficult to track. But, so it's, it's on the track of the Sasquatch with John Green. Now, when I was a youngster, when I first bought John Green's book, I was uh, struck by how similar he looked to this, uh, this actor, to someone you may recognize, because I was a great fan of science fiction. And the day the earth stood still, you know, ooh, it still it even makes my goosebumps on my, on my arms when I think about it. But uh, this is Michael Rennie, and you can see there's a striking, striking resemblance. He's a, a bit, uh, um, uh, about 10 years John Sr., I think. <laughs> and uh, so meeting John for the first time, uh, it was, uh, it was, I, I was struck by, by the resemblance. In fact, I, I had to wonder. <laughs> There's quite a, uh, uh, a literature on the interpretation of that, uh, of that phrase. And even some philosophers and, and uh, linguists have, have speculated just what it, it might mean. I think I know what it means. <laughs> so now we know. All right. So I, uh, John was really a, a larger than my figure. Uh, so here you can see this dapper, uh, young uh, uh, Bigfoot investigator, and then there's me. <laughs> this was, believe it or not, 15 years ago, here at this setting was my first uh, public presentation on the subject. And it was, it was quite a colorful event, because as some of you may know, I was discussing uh, an analysis of the Redwoods video, or as more popularly referred to, the Playmate video because the co-host of the, uh, uh, or the uh, guest host of the production company that uh, was producing the documentary that happened to get this footage was uh, a uh, former Playmate of the Year. But uh, here I had the privilege of, of rubbing shoulders with some obviously very prestigious uh, individuals in this field. It was interesting because arriving here in Harrison, there was a little confusion as to my accommodations. And so I was there at the front desk and there was no room in the inn. So rather than send me out to the, to the stables, uh, John overheard and, and uh, very hospitably stepped forward and invited me to come home with him that evening and spend the weekend. So I was uh, just tickled uh, beyond description and uh, not only to spend the time with, with John Green, but John Bitternagel was also his house guest. And so that was my first introduction. As we sat there and compared notes, you know, I, I had recollections of, of uh, ordering my, my copy of uh, On the Track of the Sasquatch after I had, had been introduced to it by my uh, school librarian. This is back in about fifth or sixth grade. And as we talked about it, he said, well, where did you go to school? He thought, he apparently thought it was a little unusual that a grade school librarian would have a copy of this on hand. And I said, well, it was in Spokane, Washington, uh, Indian Trail Elementary. He said, do you remember the librarian's name? I said, well, no, that's kind of <laughs> back there. He said, was it Mary Bessiger? And it just clicked, and it turns out that was his niece. And he, <laughs> he immediately picks up the phone and dials the number and says, Mary, you'll never guess who's sitting across the table from me. <laughs> so it was really quite uncanny, uh, small world. So as, you, as has been alluded, John uh, really has introduced a generation uh, to this subject by bringing it to the fore and going to extraordinary lengths to try to elicit scientific interest in this subject. Now, in preparing for this, it was fun to go back and, and rehearse some of the history. 
and you'll have to correct me, John, if I get anything wrong here, but it was about 1954 that you bought the advance, right, from the paper, and as a result then, um, as, as was mentioned earlier, the uh, Sasquatch days, the, some of these stories began to come to the fore, and uh, of course, John had heard stories of Sasquatch about the, the hairy Indians that lived out in the, in the wilderness, but as the stories took on a different, uh, a different uh, flavor, a different texture, that of a giant ape living in the wilderness, um, a different sort of profile or interpretation, and I shouldn't say really different, but just a different, a, a slightly uh, varied spin. You know, it doesn't surprise me at all that that there are different perceptions of a single phenomenon. Um, in, in talking, and then we see that here in uh, amongst the Bigfoot community. I mean, there are some rather hotly contested and rather heated discussions about the actual nature of Sasquatch, its, its position, either, either as a near human or a near a entity. Um, but the Ruby Creek uh, incident was one of the first times that John was able to talk to these individuals and to uh, uh, gain some really hard, no-nonsense evidence as to the existence. Uh, in this case, the form of trace, in the form of trace evidence, as outlined here in the footprint found at uh, Ruby Creek. It was some time then before uh, other tracks that came to his attention. Uh, so several years passed, and then the word of the discovery of footprints at Bluff Creek were, uh, or, or made, made the press. Now, and here's the, the classic picture, and, and I have uh, Tom to thank. He, uh, he uh, uh, gave me a, a very nice copy, uh, original print from, uh, from this news photo of uh, Jerry Crew. Now, what's interesting on the other photograph is uh, Bob Titmus holding that same cast. And you can see, obviously, it's been cleaned up a little bit. Uh, not, the way, not the way that uh, Bob, unfortunately, sometimes did clean up the cast, but I mean, as far as the dirt, you can see around the toes, so the detail uh, that's obscured here by this very probably very still very fresh track pulled out of the ground has been cleaned off. And you can see the toe detail with much greater, greater <coughs> clarity. There you can see it close up a bit. And it defines those, uh, the details of the toe stems, the, uh, the slight indication of the split ball in this larger individual that's expressed in a much more dramatic way in the 15 inch individual, the smaller, slightly smaller individual that's sometimes also seen in, in the area. Um, what I have always been impressed with too is the, uh, the other examples. You know, sometimes we get a stereotypical image based on one particular newsprint that's repeatedly published over and over and over again. But, but I was always impressed by this one. This appeared when uh, the Humboldt Times sent a reporter up to the scene. And uh, it, they also printed a photograph of the footprint in the ground, and then the resulting cast. And the, the details a little bit, a little bit uh, 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 lacking here because it was a. This is taken from a newsprint, but the variation in the toe position between these, which are, are obviously the same individual, but the variation in the toe position, the splay, the differential pressure at the foot uh, or at the heel, excuse me. And this little detail here, there, this is evidently, and, and as confirmed by the photograph of the footprint in the ground itself, is a stick that the foot stepped on. Now, if this was a static carved wooden plank of, 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 of Wallace vintage, it would have teetered on that high point unless it pushed it all the way down into the ground below the surface of the, the contact of the print. It didn't, though. The print accommodated it, obviously, and this is protruding up into the air above that contact surface quite some distance, suggesting that a soft, pliable sole of a plantar grade ape had conformed to that obstruction and uh, simply accommodated it in its step, and maybe had resulted in, you know, have uh, caused the toes to be somewhat more splayed. Um, you can't step on something like that without some, um, some consequence. Then, a few years later, that same individual, and in fact, that individual, that, that what we refer to as the 16 or 17 inch, and then the lengths, you, you, can, you can see there's some variation in print 
referring to that individual. And it's not surprising because our footprints don't always measure exactly the same length. The prints are a dynamic signature of the step, not an exact replica of the foot itself. And so the, depending on the depth, depending on the dynamics of the step, they can vary in length just a little bit. But uh, this individual, presumably the big alpha male of this region, is his footprints were showing up uh, repeatedly, and they showed up again in Heimbaum. And so here John is examining a cast which he has in his collection. So here's a photograph I took um, on one of my visits to John's place. This is back on his, his uh, deck. And you can see it compared, and it compares remarkably closely to the original Jerry Crew footprint. And there were multiple <coughs> tracks and photographs taken at that site. And these are, are great because they show a lot of good variation in toe position, a lot of detail of anatomy. I mean, there's, those are clearly good functional toes that articulate well with the foot, that are interacting with the substrate. They're not, uh, they're not Easter eggs or rectangles, or as we'll see some of the examples up here. And of course, this picture has been published in, in John's book, which shows um, a considerable variation in the toe position from, uh, between these two different uh, right and left feet at a high point. And also, a series of casts were made, and I, I, these were in, in Bob's collection, Bob Temis's collection, so I assume he made them. But again, you can see the variation in toe position, the variation in depth of imprint and, uh, and uh, uh, degrees of rotation through the midfoot. All, all testifying of a, uh, a very animate uh, footprint. One of them, when viewed on the side, has a very interesting detail, too, that caught my attention after, after Bob passed. Uh, John invited me up, and we went through a lot of his material. I had the opportunity to photograph and document all of his cast material before it was uh, transferred down to the Willow Creek Museum. The screen's a little bit rippled here, but right here where the suggestion of that uh, split in the ball is located, there is a very marked angle right here. And that confirms to me that the interpretation of that split as a flexion crease at the joint, at the, and I'll throw this one out, the halical metatarsal glandular joint, at the base of the big toe, is in fact coincident with that crease, just as the crease across the palm of your hand coincides with the joint between, at your knuckles, between your metacarp or your carpals, uh, metacarpal, excuse me, and metaproximal phalanges. So again, a very dynamic feature that certainly is not evident at first glance of the, or, 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 or expressed to any degree in the, in the crew footprint or um, some of the other individual line palm tracks. Now, there was originally reported to be three individuals at Hind Palm, and they were cited as 17-inch, uh, 16-inch, and, and a 15-inch. I can't find a differentiation between a 16 and a 17 inch in the cast that Bob had in his collection or in the photographs that were there. And so again, I think that that was one individual. And then there was this individual. And these, these have always been a bit of a quandary, you know, and I, it's one of those things you kind of sort of set aside when I think about. I force myself to really stare at these and look at these. Part of the problem is it's, it's a little bit tough to tell whether you're looking at a right or a left foot. Um, and they certainly aren't the 15 inch, uh, obviously similar to the 15 inch track found on the Blue Creek Mountain trackway or Onion Mountain and so forth. Part of the problem, I think, is because, because there were two of them, everyone always thought these were right and left, so this was a, a pair, a mated pair. I don't think they are. I think they're both uh, rights. That this, even, even though this one has a bit of a curvature here, we've seen that before because of the flexibility of the midfoot, you can get a little bit of convexity on the inside aspect of the foot as the foot pronates and the heel everts a little bit compared to the forefoot. So the large toe here and the successive toes on this side. Over here, it almost looks like a four toe track, but there is a hint of a fifth toe right here. But again, the big toe over there and over there. And after pondering on that, staring at that, looking at that, and considering it that way, comparing it to other examples, that's a pretty good, uh, it could possibly, depending on the conditions, and I don't have any photographs of footprints in the ground associated with these, 
but um, it seems the, the most parsimonious explanation would be elsewhere we've always had a 17 inch, 16, 17 inch, and the 15 inch, and the 13 inch. So here at this event, four years later, we've got a 17 inch, the alpha male, and a female. Now is it, is it the same as the Blue Creek Mountain or as Patty? Doesn't look exactly like it. So maybe there are, you know, as we've sometimes hypothesized, we have a dominant male with a range overlapping that of several females, 15 inch being in the female size range. So maybe this is Patty's sister. <laughs> All right, so I've, I've alluded a couple times to the Blue Creek Mountain trackways. There were two individuals, at least, maybe three. There was reports of three originally, but uh, John only observed a 15 and a 13 inch. There's one photograph, however, that might be an 11 inch, but I, I'm kind of, the more I look at it, I think that there was just a, a little bit of a um, slippage or something that uh, it, it could have actually been the 13 inch, but just uh, mis, uh, mismeasured or mis, mischaracterized. One single footprint only. Um, so, no evidence anywhere else of, a, of an 11 inch showing up in that time or that region. But here's the 13 inch on the, on the left and, and the 15 inch on the right. Now, this has got to be one of the most well documented, documented incidents due to the thorough examination by uh, not only John and Renee, but Don Abbott, the, the anthropologist, archaeologist from uh, University of British Columbia, and, uh, and several other agency people. He was able to get uh, uh, to persuade a couple of academics to come out from Humboldt State and had a look as well. But also, one of the most controversial uh, sets of footprints of late. So let's look just at this a little bit um, and, and uh, address some of the arguments that have been made and take a step back and look at the big picture and just see what, uh, what might be going on. Now, one of the problems was this little feature right down here, that you can see here, and over here, right there. We got a close up. This was pointed to by a number of people as the smoking gun. That in fact, this was a hoaxed track, and this little ridge here was equated with a score line that appears in one of Wallace's car footprints. Okay, well, let's look at the data, at what we have. Um, here are a series of footprints of the right foot, of the 15 inch foot on uh, Bluff Creek and a couple of other spots. There's the, um, oh shucks, I just went blank, uh, Hooker, the Hooker photographs that uh, the provenience is not 100%, but I think Chris was of the opinion that they were associated with the Onion Mountain Road. So they may have been uh, uh, separated by a little bit of time from the Blue Creek Mountain trackway that was examined. But if you look here, you know, no indication whatsoever of a line. Um, one here, a slight one here. This picture from the cover of John's book, there's a little row of little pebbles, a little, little uh, not pebbles, but a little, uh, um, Globules of dust or dirt that have kind of lined up somewhat. Big ones here, somewhat in the same spot, but not exactly. This appears to be closer to the wall, uh, to the border of the, of the track than this one. Nothing there. We can uh, grab another four. Nothing. 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 So it's a very inconsistent uh, in imprint or, or a, a signature marking. I would argue that. One possibility that has to be considered, these two photographs are pretty widely known. This one's been published in a number of places since that event occurred. If someone were to create, attempt to create something that resembles these footprints, that's a kind of a glaring feature that they might focus in on. Uh, you know, a, a case in point for comparison, Bob Hieronymus, who claimed to be in the Patterson Inland film, obviously, in my opinion, studied that film to try to imitate the walk. 
And you'll remember that one of the things that he did when he walked with that kind of funny patty walk is he turned his hand back so the palm was facing posterior. Why did he do that? Because one of the published photos of 352 from Rennie's copy of the film, or from the Sebra Chrome, I think it was, that was made from that, that, that Rennie had the licensure to, has a blemish on the frame that coincides with the hand. And I've witnessed long discussions on, online about what this OK sign means that this hand is making. And why does it have such a big, long thumb that seems to be on the wrong side of the hand and pointing in the wrong direction? Because it's not, they're not digits. It's a circle. It's a little blemish on the film. But it makes it look like her hand is turned way back and her fingers are curled like this. That's the only reason I can think why in the world Bob would walk like this. Okay? So Wallace trying to make a, a, a copy that would resemble these widely publicized, you know, extensively photographed footprints, saw that line there and introduced a score, which obviously isn't a natural feature of the wood grain, uh, to be to have it be accepted as a quote signature. Let's look at some other things, the reasons why. Here's another thing. This just occurred to me as preparing this, this uh, presentation. The revelation of these carved wooden feet revealed that, at least in the case of this pair of tracks, he didn't do what you would normally think to do in attaching a strap, which would be to curl it on top and screw it in so that it would leave no possible uh, scuffing of your track. Instead, the straps are screwed in on the side, so from the front you can see the leather extending forward on both sides. Now, look at where they're located. Just opposite the lower part of the bulge there on the medial side of the foot. And then this one is right here. So here's that bulge and it's sticking up right there. I think the only reason you can't see it is because it's really strong shadow. And I thought about it, I should have gotten in Photoshop this and, and um, lighten that up, reduce the contrast. But go back and look at these. Can you see any indication on any one of those tracks, even when the dust is fairly deep, of a strap mark on the side of those footprints? Me neither. Okay. And we also have lots of other, oh, not lots, there are other casts that have not been widely publicized. Uh, these were were in the materials I got from the Dr. Grover Kranz. This one is actually an original that John cast and given to Grover. This was a copy, I think it was a copy, of a molded uh, uh, cast that unfortunately he uh, poured the plaster and forgot about it. And as you know, some types of latex, the process of the hardening of the plaster can actually burn it right to the latex. And it, it stuck. It's, it's uh, vulcanized right on. And he was going to throw it away. And I said, no, no, don't throw it away. And I took hours and hours picking and picking, and then finally I just got a blowtorch because the plaster could, could, could take it, and I just burned the rubber off and scraped it, and you can still see the remnants of it there. But you can still see the shape proportions. And, and it makes a great contrast to show the variation in the differential pressure of the forward hind foot, especially with their its mobility through the midfoot. So narrower heel here, a big, big wide heel there with a lot of heel pressure, much wider on the fore part of the foot, which also corresponds with the toes tending to line up straighter because when the fore part of the foot is taking more of the weight, there seems to also be a tendency to flex the toes more sharply. And as you can see with your own fingers, when they're extended, you have a lot of variation in length and apparent size. But if you flex your fingers, what happens? They line up like peas in a pod, and the little round tips are all you see. Okay. All right. It was also suggested, I mean, this is one of, the, of uh, Wallace's carvings in the center. And these were some copies that Grover had in his collection that he published in, uh, in his book. And uh, Chris in, in uh, the old Sasquatch. Uh, noted the similarity, but I think it's really important to point out this is a photograph of the 13-inch, as best I can tell from that orientation. So even though on at, at, at a view, 
it had some resemblances to that on that, and viewed from that angle, it's four inches shorter, three or four inches shorter, and the, the toes are, uh, or the, uh, the proportions are very different than this one. Now we'll look now at, well, here, before we leave that, Barry, I want you to keep in mind too, this is a, this is a signature Wallace carving or fabrication. Notice the <laughs> Easter egg looking toes, very rounded, uh, no evidence of toe stems. In other words, the, 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 uh, uh, the toe itself, uh, exclusive of the, the tip. Uh, the exaggerated uh, split heel, but usually at a very sharp angle upward uh, towards the end of the foot. And uh, in some of them, then really exaggerate the curvature here, but we don't see that so much on this particular one. Uh, now, by comparison, um, as you look here, look across, I wanted you to, uh, uh, well, see, what am I doing? I got out of sequence. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you with this was, these are the, the uh, 3D scans that have been executed of all of uh, Bob Tiffis' original cast material. Uh, these are the 10 that he cast 10 days after the film shot at the Bluff Creek uh, film site. But um, uh, one of the, the things I wanted to draw attention to was, was this feature right here. And you can see the highlight, how the highlight kind of highlights a ridge right there. So what looks like, not a ridge, but just a, an angle, an angle. That her heel has a slight angle right there. Now, this is just a thought, though. Uh, if that, if the score line was added to the walls carving in imitation of some other feature, what caused that feature? What caused those, that little bit of dust to line up right there? If it wasn't, if there wasn't a groove in the, in the, uh, in the foot? Well, if there is a slight anatomical artifact of Patty's foot, or in the low, and I'm going to make the argument that the Blue Creek Mountain tracks were left by Patty, uh, and John and I don't agree 100% on that. I'm not sure if he's given any ground on that yet or not, but uh, right here, that is where that line would have been. So you can imagine that if her foot has just a you know slight deformity or slight callus on the outside edge of that foot that causes this ever so slight indentation, if a little bit of that fine dust had blown down in or fallen into the track, it could roll right down and stop right along that line. Just like, I mean, obviously, let's go back real quick. Obviously, this stuff wasn't left by a groove in a fake foot. That's material that has been knocked into, and all this stuff you wouldn't expect to be there. It would be squashed absolutely flat. So all this stuff has fallen or rolled into the track, been blown in or, or as a car passed. And so if there was a slight little angle in her foot due to, say, a callus on the outside edge of her heel there that caused a slight angle right along there, those bits of dust have just lined up because that's a breaking point in the contour, the bottom of the foot. Okay, so just an alternate hypothesis to consider. Okay, now here's a here's a little gift that I grabbed off, and I can't give credit because I can't remember where I got it. But it was on the, the BFF, which I almost never visit. Uh, now um, it shows that little artifact. But the person posting this suggested that if you look at this one first, that here you can see the heel of the boot. Here's the heel of the boot. Here's the outline of the boot up here. But then one of the respondents said, well, yes, I can see that. But in this imprint, here's the big toe. And here's the outline of a foot showing through the rubber sole of Patty's costume. Now, Puzzle me this, how do you have a costume that has a foot that's flimsy enough for a foot or a boot, take a pick, from one step to the next, pushing through a rubber-soled fake foot, and yet it's rigid enough that a six to eight hundred pound of necessity weight, weighted subject, can push those footprints of an inch and a half into 
firm, moist sand on the Blood Creek sandbar. I mean, do these people actually think through the, 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 the consequence of the, their arguments? Every once in a while, someone will say, Jeff, go look on uh, Randy's, uh, that, what is it called? Randy's forum, the... Uh, Pardon? Yes. And uh, there's a few people who, thankfully, I don't know who, they're, who they actually are. <laughs> Willie Parcher and, and Kid Kazi. Uh, uh, my goodness, get a life. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. uh, I was surprised when I saw this online, John. Uh, I thought this was our secret. <laughs> he, told, he told me not to tell anybody about these things. It would be better if I didn't discuss these, but on one of my visits, John took me down to the Lakeshore Harrison, and he pulls out of the bag uh, this pair of footprints, which he had constructed for to conduct experiments. It's like, he's, he's, you know, this is the unfortunate thing. Uh, Paul Friedman got really, uh, in large measure, a bad rap. I'm not saying that everything he did was above reproach, but uh, he uh, one time publicly had acknowledged that he had experimented in his backyard what it would take to fabricate a footprint so he could better evaluate I mean, his rationale so he could better evaluate footprints in the fields. And most of us that are good researchers when it comes to footprints have done similar types of experimentation in our own as well. But as a result of that, he was labeled as a hoaxer. And so, uh, John was very concerned that this type of research might be used as fodder for uh, accusations of hoaxing. But he had this pair of feet, which are made out of fiberglass, and then fiberglass two apparel sneakers, very uncomfortable to put on. And then he had another pair that were carved out of wood that were, they looked like those, uh, those, uh, those shoes they make today with the rocker bottom. And uh, they were carved out of wood and had just some leather straps, you know, of, of the uh, sort that Wallace uh, claims to have done all his fabricating with. Went down to Harrison, Hop, uh, Harrison Lane to the lake shore, and we were doing a, little, a couple of experiments. And uh, on that firm sand, it wasn't even a mark, a visible. I mean, a couple of little tiny indentations on the toe, and if you really angled your foot up, you could, you could barely make an indentation at the margin. So John has these uh, uh, feet on, on his uh, or his shoes or over his feet, and he says, "Come jump on my back." <laughs> and I, I said, "Don't you mean you jump on my back?" He said, "No, no, come on, jump on my back." <laughs> and uh, so I jumped on, you know, 200 pounds about that time. Jumped on his back, and so with our combined weight, we still. And he goes. Trapes it across the sand. <laughs> <laughs> and with my pair of fake feet sticking out to the sides, it was quite a sight. I'm sure we're trying to make sure no one was watching down at the lodge or going way up to the upper end of the beach. <laughs> but uh, even with 400 pounds, it didn't hardly make the sort of tracks. I mean, nothing, nothing by comparison to the tracks that John witnessed and photographed. Even in dry sand, especially in dry sand, there would be no indication whatsoever. And yet here we can see uh, tracks that were uh, from that same time period photographed on the Bluff Creek sandbar itself, and instead of the road, the road beds up above. Okay. Um, then one time when I was uh, uh, rifling, and John was allowing me to rifle through some of his files and look at things, and duplicate pictures and whatnot, I came upon these shots, and these were original photographs that he received from uh, Don Abbott that had been taken while during Don's visit. Now this also, right off the bat, I mean, look at the texture of that soil and so forth, and yet those footprints are imprinted. I can't imagine that kind of detail and that depth of imprint with, uh, I mean, it's one thing to argue that maybe on a dusty road on the soft shoulder, you know, you could get the indication of an of a, uh, artifice a fake carved foot leaving a good imprint, but in that kind of textured soil, uh, uh, it's hard hard to imagine. But this is the kicker. This was the third photograph. Now I want to be absolutely sure that you're seeing what I'm seeing, so I'm going to give you a help there. This is what I refer to as a half track. So here on the Blue Creek Mountain Track is a good example of where either its step was a little longer than a normal.
normal walking step or it uh, was striding out or, or was, uh, running a little bit. But there's absolutely no indication back here of imprint. And yet, as if you've seen in my, in my book, when you overlay that, you can overlay that very well to one of the previous ones, and it breaks it right at the appropriate proportionality to uh, coincide with the mid-tarsal break, with the uh, transverse tarsal joint. And I'm going to stop saying break, because I've had some protracted conversations with a couple of individuals, and I won't name anyone in particular, but who seem, always seem to fall into the mindset that when that a break refers to some dysfunction, some uh, degeneration of the foot, where it has broken down rather than, than uh, describing simply a axis of flexion that allows for movement in a, in a range of motion that our foot is constrained. Okay, so you've all seen these pictures. Um, you can see this is Rand Mullins with, with his original, and what I want to emphasize here is the look of the carved feet, uh, the typical carved feet. This one is quite honestly very primitive, very square feet, toes straight across the end of the foot, no, no toe angle whatsoever, and the toes being very, only very crudely rounded. Uh, Wallace even criticized these, said, oh, nobody would be fooled by those. <laughs> and, and in print in the newspaper. And so here's, but here's Wallace's. Now this photograph, as I understand, was taken in Toledo, Washington, which is after Wallace went back to live in his home state of Washington. He was in California on contract work doing the, the road construction. But these are the typical, stereotypical tracks that Wallace produced. Again, the Easter egg toes in a straight line, the highly exaggerated split ball, the bulging, uh, you know, medial side of the foot, and the really relatively narrow heel breadth, except for the little squat ones that uh, look very distinctive, that look like they've been cinched around the waist and things bulging out all over. Here's a close-up just to show you again. This is, in fact, probably one that was uh, figured in, uh, in the figure that uh, Chris had put together. Um, so you know, take a good look at that. And then ask yourself, what was the inspiration? What prompted him to suddenly, or somebody, whether it was them or whether it was the heirs, whether it was uh, um, one of the nephews or so forth, or sons, to, to come forward with this pair of footprints? Well, I think I know what the inspiration was. It was that these were made after the fact. They weren't made, they weren't the, the uh, uh, producers of the footprints, but they were made after the fact. Okay, so let's turn our attention to the 13-inch to the, uh, uh, tracks. Now this, this is a, such a stunning picture because of its clarity, but unfortunately, it's one of those situations where the remarkable clarity. It's like it's like Roger when Roger Patterson produced the or cast his two footprints. He picked the flattest, clearest examples he could find, and they looked remarkably un or non-dynamic. And that uh, and because they were so flat and archless and featureless, otherwise other, all of the toes are remarkably well preserved. The anatomy is there. It's a great mold of the foot. But it's not a very dynamic step uh, register. And that uh, precipitated a lot of criticism. Same way with this. You know, uh, Chris Murphy did a really nice little expose talking about how it is that, that you know, that these, this part right here between the toes and the forefoot looks completely undisturbed. Would this be the result of a stiff foot with carved, very curled toes? the tips of which impressed, but left the intervening there undisturbed. You know, and that is curious. I think some of it can be explained with that little example I just showed you, that by tightly curling the toes, or the toes they tend to line up more. The, the size of the tips is a little less differentiated, especially here at the, the great toe in this younger individual, presumably. Um, but otherwise, I mean, it looks very natural. There's good, uh, there's tension cracks surrounding it that suggests a nice even footfall. There's no impact crater or, even, or ridging around it. 
Uh, even the details, the contour of the uh, flexion crease there looks very, very natural. It doesn't look like a stereotyped contour that Wallace's footprints exhibit. And then when you consider the multiple number of casts that are made of the 13 inch, you can see a lot of variation. You can see toes here that are much more extended with evidence of toe uh, stems present there. And even over here, the great toe has a little more continuity. There's a little artifact there that are not artifact, but a little jumbling there that might be obscuring the detail. If I point to the wrong, wrong spot right over here. Okay, this was one that Doug Far in is one that's down in uh, Al Hashin's collection that he was given by John on the occasion of those casts being done. And here's the opposite side. Again, look at the one on the left. The, the toe stem for the great toe is more obvious there. There isn't an unbroken ridge of material across. So again, when you take a step back, you don't become myopic and focus on one feature. You take a step back and look at the, the big picture, the variation is present suggests a very natural, very dynamic footfall uh, evidenced in the whole composite. Now this is another one I grabbed offline. This one compares Al Hodgson's cast, which has been uh, multiply replicated and dispersed. I mean, it pops up all over the place, and there's some interesting stories where it's been at the root of some attempts to hoax evidence. And then again, comparing it to the Wallace, and yeah, it looks it looks pretty similar. And then comparing it to one of the Blue Creek Mountain tracks here. Now, one of the things that has caused some people to take exception to Al Hodgson's as possibly being fake is this remarkably square off toe, which seems to echo the unnaturally square off toe over here in the Wallaces. And then look carefully. Now, notice really carefully the sharp lines here and the, uh, you know, the incomplete differentiation of the little toe. Here is a photograph of the original of Al's cast, which I photographed in, in on Foss, straight on Foss on the, on the right here, turned about oh, a, third, a third of the angle there, a uh, quarter angle, maybe say. Um, but the point is, you can see that the, the original cast has the stain from the soil in which it was cast. But there's this bright spot right up here. And in fact, there is, the, we were talking about it last night, uh, uh, I, can, I honestly, at the moment, can't remember if that is an indentation or if it's sticking out, because it was suggested that, that perhaps there was a stick or some twigs, as was evidenced in, in, uh, uh, in, in some of the photographs uh, associated with this. My first thought when I saw that was that when Al was cleaning this up, that he got, as I sometimes do, got a little impatient. The cast wasn't completely cured yet, it was still a little green. And as he was scraping the mud out from the, uh, between the toes, like the difference between the crew cast and when Titmus was holding it, someone had taken some care and cleaned that out, that he might have scored that plaster, and in so doing, revealed the white plaster underneath. Or the other possibility that someone brought up last night was that the toe had kind of wrapped over a twig, and then removing that twig, it <laughs> removed some of the plaster. But the point is, that if you look at the other toes, there's good connection to the, the forefoot. There aren't the squared off toes like you see in the Wallaces. And I think that feature has been exaggerated um, uh, in the carvings in imitation of this. I wouldn't be surprised. We know that the Wallaces had a cleaned up copy of, of the 15 inch track that they got from Bob Titmus. Shorty acknowledged that. Uh, at, some, at one point, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if Al had, uh, if they'd gotten a copy or had access to a copy. Al says that he probably has made about 100 copies of that, of that cast over the years as people have requested copies of it. Okay, um, another, another point. Here's, uh, uh, these un uh, unfortunately have gotten a lot of uh, press as well. These are the, quote, cleaned up tracks that uh, Bob Titmus, where he took two of the 15 inch tracks and and um, in, just to make them aesthetically more cleaned up, 
uh, smoothed off the surface, and in the process, I think, made them look much more blocky and bulky than they really are. In fact, I, I know that. Oh, I don't have that slide. No, nope. missed a slide. Uh, if you, you can go down to the Willow Creek Museum and look at those originals upon which these cleaned up versions were based. They're not as blocky. The contours are much more natural looking and uh, they're, they're very, uh, very satisfying to observe. Now, how many of you remember this from um, Ivan Sanderson's book, the, the uh, glossy plates in the center of Ivor Sanderson's book? Every time I saw that, I thought, man, that's got to be, and especially when I learned about, uh, that's got to be the clearest track I've ever seen. And, and I thought, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Sanderson's caption, he talked about an Oman track in clay. And so I'm imagining some but he find a nice big uh, deposit of clay. I mean, we used to find it when I was a kid. We'd mine them out and take them home. And that was our play at the time. But, uh, the, the, a Sasquatch had just happened to step, had stepped in the perfect substrate to make an absolutely clear track. Well, that's not the case at all. This is a cropped in photograph of the mold of the cleaned up footprint that, that Bob made. And there it is. I mean, I, when I, we went through Bob's things, I was able to, in fact, these casts that I have in my collection were made from that mold, and that mold is made out of plaster. And to pull a cast from that, he had a can still sitting there next to it of axle grease. And you'd take the axle grease and you'd work it into the plaster of the mold really well, and John said, go ahead and do it. And so I, I put the grease on, poured the plaster in, waited for a while, and then Crossing my fingers, took the rubber mallet that was there and carefully started whapping on this to separate it. And they popped out, amazingly. I was just, I didn't try to think, what would I do if it cracked or broke the, the mold? But this is a picture that Sanderson took of that mold, which gives it a very, you know, unnatural look to it. Okay, speaking of carved feet, um, we have this one, Ray Pickens. Uh, from uh, uh, near Colville, Washington. And of course, he's the one who, well, he did claim, he, and he certainly did, faked a lot of tracks. And they have been, his, his claim to faking has been equated with the Bosberg footprints. And I know there's lots of, uh, still lots of controversy surrounding that whole incident, the involvement of Ivan Marks, and, and uh, Rennie was very convinced at the time. He kind of became a little more guarded of his, his opinion over time. John has expressed a lot of skepticism because of Ivan Marks' involvement. But I tell you, if Ivan Marks faked these, then we might as well all go home because we'll never be able to tell the difference between a real and a fake footprint. These are, in my opinion, amongst the best anatomical uh, examples of a real footprint uh, that we can come up with. And I can go over and run out of time. Well, I can tell you stories about discussing these with orthopedic surgeons and, and, and others with expertise in the possible pathologies. The point I wanted to make is, first and foremost, that obviously Ray Pickens' carved feet were not responsible for these. I didn't have a scale for his, but this is approximate. His, they were about probably about 16 inches based on the, on the videos that uh, he shows it but they're often shown sideways so you can see the attached foot, or a boot. But I wanted to show it straight on so you could see the uh, anatomy. The other day, we were doing one of the interviews I was doing, I had a series of examples out on, on the lab bench and, and uh, while they were juggling with the lighting and so forth, I was just sitting there staring at them and I had the Hereford cast sitting right beside a copy of the undeformed Bosberg track. And man, all of a sudden it just jumped out at me. It just hit me how similar they actually were. And so we were doing a little exercise and um, Chris Murphy and I were sending some things back and forth. He was drawing some attention to another photograph and we weren't sure if it was uh, from the, the Cripplefoot Bosberg tracks or if it was, John thought it was a photograph of tracks that I and Mark's claim would have found sometime later. Uh, but in any case, we, so we were doing some superimposition, and so I thought I'm going to do the same thing, and so I, I superimposed the, and you, it's hard to tell, it, it's much better if you can fade back and forth and do this and kind of move it around. But the similarity of proportion and shape and toe configuration and outline of the sole pad 
between those two is so remarkably similar. It's just really quite amazing. Again, what are the chances of two people, you know, if someone faked these tracks, you know, and I'm sure it's not a case of copycat, uh, someone faked these tracks and someone, and Ivan Marks faked the Bosworth tracks, but what are the chances of them converging on such a uh, remarkably natural looking anatomy that also has, I mean, I can show you other examples. Well, we'll get to a couple of those. All right, the patterson gimlin film. Now, I argued that, and what I think is another reason for confidence in the Blue Creek Mountain tracks is their remarkable similarity to the patterson gimlin film subjects' footprints. And these, this is uh, the pair of tracks that were taken by Roger. And uh, remarkably clear. I mean, they're just, they're gorgeous. As far as looking, you can see the toe stems, you can see the, the layout of the toes really nicely. You can see the ever slight hint here of the split ball. But since the toes are fully extended, you know, you get that uh, indication of the, of the crease most when the toes are strongly flexed. So it's just ever slight indentation here. There's even a bulge here that corresponds to the navicular and the very flat foot. One of those bones of the tarsus is down in contact with the ground. In us, with an arch, it's up in the air. But in a flat foot, it's down in the ground, so it leaves its own distinctive bulge right there. So again, this week, like I said, John and I kind of went back and forth on this. Uh, part of the problem has been that this this cast has been, or actually this one doesn't usually get replicated, it's the, it's the other foot that has been most replicated, and has been replicated so many times, and I can show you this in my, in my lab, um, the latex molds that are used in replication tend to shrink a little bit as they age. And um, I have a copy, another copy of a copy, that's about an inch shorter. It's about 13 and a half inches instead of 14 and a half inches long. Um, and the, the right foot is fully, the original, as measured um, uh, with good scale in, in, in various re early representations, is a full 15 inches long, uh, as is also indicated. I mean, you can see there's some variation, obviously, in the, in the, uh, the resulting length of the foot, uh, depending on the, the, the nature of the step and the condition of substrate. So when you look at Bob Tennis's row of 10, there's some remarkable variation in the length of that. But here's, here's that, uh, that photo from John's book. And uh, quite some time ago, you know, I did a careful tracing to scale of those two. And the similarity is remarkable. Now, I doubt anybody in here would question the authenticity of this footprint. Now, what would be the odds again of this footprint being so remarkably similar to the tracks on the Blue Creek Mountain roadway just a month and a half earlier uh, by sheer coincidence? You know, how, well, how would Wallace have stumbled on a particular shape that was so remarkably different and divergent from all these other stereotypical fake carvings that just happened to also be almost identical? Accepting just a few minor details, which can be accounted for given the variation in the substrate with the Patterson Gimlin film subject footprints. So here's here is the one of the casts of the 15 inch that was made by Bob Titmus, not on the Blue Creek Mountain track, but down in the sandbar uh, on Bluff Creek. And here it is compared to one of the tracks from the Patterson Gimlin. Now, obviously, you know, if you if you just look at the proportions, look at the arrangement of the toes. And this one, obviously, there's more flexion. The flexion is distorted. The toe imprints made them look longer um, and, and obliterated the, the uh, toe stems a bit, so you don't see them as clearly as you do over there. But uh, in my professional, personal opinion, those are the same. Now, someone jumped to another, jumped tracks here to another one. This appeared online. I think this was in the BFF. I tried to read located, couldn't find it, so I just had to make a scan of one of the printouts that I had in my files. But somebody was taking me to task about the mid-tarsal break, my interpretation of the foot skeleton and its correlation to the evidence of the mid-tarsal pressure ridge at the film site here from the photo by Lyle Laverty. So he took this individual, I don't know who it was, um, 
it was a pseudonym anyway, uh, took this photo and he said, okay, this is oblique, so we're going to take Dr. Meldrum's reconstructed foot skeleton that was based on one of Patterson's footprints, uh, uh, casts, and he said, we've got to kind of squeeze it down and foreshorten it a little bit for the, to sort of match the obliqueness of, of this. And he said, aha, look, the position of, his, of the transverse tarsal joint in his reconstruction is behind the pressure ridge. It doesn't fit. It does, his model falls apart. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it right. I took the scan of the Titmus cast from the virtual archive. And this is the original sketch that I had done. And again, these are this is an attempt to approximate the position of uh, points of articulation of joints. I'm not saying that the skeleton looks exactly like this, you know, obviously. But 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 we have suggestions. The slight indentation corresponds with this joint. The uh, greatest point of convexity on this side corresponds with this joint. You know, the flexion accre crease across here or the termination of the sole pad is roughly coincident with those joints, and so on. Um, but when you overlay that uh, without messing around with perceived angles of view or obliquity, sure enough, here I've highlighted it lightly here. Here's the transfer tarsal joint. There's the pressure release ridge right there. So it falls right anterior to the pressure release ridge. So again, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, and I think everyone has heard probably the tarsal break by now, but, but this is the result of the retention of a greater degree of mobility of the midfoot. Uh, this is a primitive hominoid condition, uh, a legacy of, of uh, uh, vertical climbing. So instead of a fixed arch, which pivots at the ball of the foot, when the heel first elevates, the fulcrum is here at this flexible transverse tarsal joint. Heel comes up independently, weights over the fore part of the foot, pressure causes a pressure release, and the substrate conditions are, are appropriate for that. There's no way to account for these half tracks other than resorting to this explanation of the foot anatomy. You simply cannot get this kind of a footprint with a foot that has a stiff human-like arch. Period. You just can't. So either these are fake, or they indicate a foot that has a transverse tarsal joint with a much greater range of motion. Okay. Now here's another example, um, and I hadn't actually done this exercise until until now. I, I created this back when uh, Teo Stein did his big uh, uh, feature article in the Denver Post. So again, it's just a, a speculative reconstruction, but it's quite easy here. Again, you take the Greatest point of convexity, and that corresponds with that joint. I mean, that's a that's an axiom. That's n nothing speculative about that. Okay. And over here, these bulges are best explained as some arthritic inflammation of this joint and this joint. There's a second bulge right here, which in every human foot that is present and visible, you if you go walk through a wet puddle barefoot and step onto the pavement, you'll see. Nine times out of ten in most people's feet, that same bulge right there, which corresponds to that joint. Here's a half track associated with this Hereford cast. Superimpose then, and here's the transverse tarsal joint right at the terminus of the half track, exactly where you would expect it. Okay. All right, now take all that and go across the Pacific Ocean to China. And one of my visits there, I had the opportunity to. Uh, interview a witness, a ranger at the Shenzhen National Reserve, who had seen a yarn at a very close distance, probably about 200 yards. But he could see it clear enough that uh, he yelled at it. It, it was sunning itself on a rock. On, he was up at the head of a canyon, on one side of the canyon, on the opposite side, opening in the forest. There was a big boulder there, and there was this big reddish brown pile of hair. And he thought it was an odd paper for a bear out there in the daytime, so he yells across at it, sat up and turned and looked at it, flat face, no ears on top of its head, slid off the rock, strode into the forest, and disappeared. He went up around the head of the canyon, tracked it, had a spring where there was some nice soft soil, found a pair of tracks, very clear tracks. When they revealed them to me, my jaw dropped. So here they were. 
really evident in that perspective there. Here is a track that in shape and proportion is almost identical to the that was cast from the Patterson Gamble film site. Shows the same pressure ridge, same position, same configuration. Again, what are the odds? This is a, 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 very, a man of very humble means who has no access to cable television, documentaries. He doesn't, uh, he asked me through the interpreter, do, do you have something like the Yaren in the United States? Well, a bag. <laughs> um, so I, I'm absolutely confident this isn't a this isn't a, a circumstance of copycat. There's no way. Now why would he choose this one? You know, most people who see this think this is a broken footprint cast that I glued back together somehow. I think something's wrong with it. Okay, why is choose that? Um, one of my contacts, and I don't know if, if Igor knows this gentleman. He was those of you who were at the Yakima uh, event. Uh, his name is Dmitri Pirkulov. Have you had any interaction with him, Igor? Dmitry Pirkulov? No? We'll talk about later. Pirkulov. Pirkulov. Okay. I don't have the right accent. Um, anyway, recently he sent me this photograph and on a trip to the North Caucasus in Georgia had uh, uh, encountered a, uh, there was an event at a, a village where they had tracked this individual for quite some distance, a mile or two, but he sent this photograph. I mean, this is from the Blue Mountains outside of Walla Walla. It was in Paul Freeman's collection. Here's an example. It's larger by an inch, but remarkably similar, consistent, and finally, most of them. Um, so here's that one. Here, uh, we made an effort, and I don't recommend you all run out and do this because I don't think it would be as, as useful if everyone inundated the offices, but John Majinski and I made an effort to open lines of communication with uh, regional uh, forest service offices and uh, game and fish departments and National Park Service, particularly in the areas of our, of our study sites in, in the Intermountain West. We were received very positively, put together an information packet that included literature and our business cards and a DVD of a, of a respectable documentary that featured some of our field work and a uh, copy of my book, some reprints, and so forth. And had excellent interactions with these personnel. Uh, we made a blitz and, and visited over 12 offices in three days and had meetings, you know, that ranged from 20 minutes to two hours in length. And uh, two weeks later, I come back from a trip and a phone message is on my machine in my office. And here's the park ranger, a biologist at one of the offices. He said, this is too coincidental. Did you guys have something to do with this? Mm -hmm. He said two of his uh, backcountry rangers had just discovered footprints. Uh, this is, doesn't quite do it justice, but here, here's one of the best examples mm -hmm. right there. Uh, it turns out, and unfortunately, there was a little bit of a lapse of time. By the time the rangers had gotten to where they had phone service, made the report, and then he called me, and I got back in town. It was about seven days had lapsed. Um, but there was a cluster of seasonal cabins that uh, uh, were occupied at the time. This was back in late, late last summer. And uh, the neighbors came out and found these footprints all over the place. They were winding and meandering in amongst the, the cabins. They backtracked it. They could track them back into the forest for quite some distance. They called the rangers. And one of them even accused the other of having faith in them. Uh, and he said, no, I didn't do it. And uh, they were a little bit concerned uh, about it. Obviously, they were a good 16-inch, uh, 16-inch, uh, I'm done, I think, so anyways. So, um, <laughs> oh, get used to somebody else's mouse. Um, so in any case, one more example of very good, clear footprints and I guess the point that I wanted to make is just you know, look at the consistency. You know, there's, there's this impression, and I was uh, guilty of it too, I, I guess, early on in my exposure to the literature on Sasquatch, that when you looked at the footprints, there was such a tremendous variation. It seemed like no two tracks were alike. Well, that was one of the first things I tackled when I got into this, was is there a repeat appearance of individuals? And yes, there are many, many examples of 
consistently repeated appearances of individuals, sometimes discovered by totally independent witnesses. But when you step back and look at the whole thing, when you appreciate the anatomy, oh, here's one I didn't mention. This is, you've seen this in John's book, uh, due to uh, with, uh, due communications with our Russian colleagues, but this was uh, submitted to Boris Porzhenev in 1963 from the uh, Tian Shan mountain range in Mongolia. I assume it's in Mongolia. That's the, that, that's the Tian Shan in Tian Western Shan. Mongolia? No, Tian Shan is in uh, Russia, but yeah. uh, in Mongolia there is uh, Altai. Okay, Altai, all right. So over in that in that uh, region west of Mongolia. But, but in any case, you can see remarkable consistency. The underlying anatomy is consistent and yet distinct. It's distinct in ways that biomechanically are very sound and, uh, and evolutionarily are very adapted to the habitat in which these organisms live. It, it really makes a lot of sense. So, uh, in final then, just thanks John for, for uh, opening this fascinating mystery to the world and, and for uh, providing the opportunity for me to embark on one of the most interesting uh, lines of research that I could possibly imagine. Thank you.